great. Okay. So um, I think we're just waiting a few more minutes to get started, everyone. So welcome to those of you who are here online. We have, for those of you who are the early arrivers, we've already shared in the chat box the Mentimeter that you can already start to complete while you're waiting. And we'll get uh, started in about uh, three minutes. And if I can just ask those of you who we can hear some wonderful background noise, I'm if coming, you can just coming. remember to mute your, uh, your, your, uh, uh, mute when you're not uh, speaking. They Thank go you. away before you start crying again. Okay. <laughs> Jessica, I'm just asking a technical question. Can we, um, can you mute colleagues? Um, yes, I think I can. Let me just check that. Yes, I just muted you. <laughs> so I can do that. So you'll need to unmute yourself, yeah. Okay. So I'll be, yeah. This is Guillaume oh. speaking. How are you? Hi, Guillaume. Glad you could join us. <laughs> Glad to be so here. We, yes, great. So we're just going to wait another um, two minutes. I'm just trying to make sure I have my clock on so I don't lose track of the time. And we'll get we started were, very soon. We were confused because we thought um, it's um, UK time rather than Geneva time. So I'm glad I'm still here. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Good. So just another minute and then we'll get started, everyone. Sure. So you already posted a question in Mentimeter. That yes. means, uh, should we start to write answer or we will do later? Yes, yes. you can start <laughs> while we're waiting to do okay, the Mentimeter. Yeah, maybe we can do. Uh, we have one minute more, right? Yeah, depends on how fast you are writing. I don't okay. think. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that I'm writing fast anyway. Excellent. Well, great, great to see so many colleagues online. Um, I recognize quite a few of the names, so we're very excited that you're going to join us today. Um, just get, so I think we're, uh, we're ready to start. So thank you everyone for, the, for, for joining us in this session. Um, my name's Amanda Melville. I'm the Senior Advisor for Child Protection in UNHCR. And I'll just ask my colleagues to introduce themselves uh, starting with Martha. Hello everyone and thank you so much Amanda and Jessica for the preparations. My name is uh, Martha Hill. Um, I'm based in Jordan in Amman um, and I, I work for Terre Zone. My position is uh, Access to Justice Regional Program Coordinator. So I, I, I work with different countries in the region on the program and very specifically on access to justice for children and youth issues. So welcome and thanks for being here. Great. And now I hand over to Cedric. Hi there. I'm Cedric Foussard. I work for Terre des Hommes as well, like my colleague Marta, and uh, I work for the uh, head office on the Access to Justice program. Uh, in particular, I'm in charge of uh, research, advocacy, and global learning. And I uh, manage as well uh, a joint activity between three organizations, our Reform International and the, the International Association of Family Judges and Magistrates which is a global initiative on justice with children. Great, thank you very much, Cedric. And Guillaume, over to you. Hi, good morning from Montreal, Canada. My name is Guillaume Landry. I'm the Director General of the International Bureau for Children's Rights, an international agency based here that works on um, building capacity of child protection systems actor, including on justice with children for children. Um, and we've been co-leading for the past five years a task force within the Alliance together with Terre des Hommes on what used to be standard 14 and is now standard 20 in the package of minimum standards on uh, justice for children. Excellent. Great. So thank you everyone for joining. It's very exciting to have everybody here. As you can see, we're going to be talking about justice for children in, in emergency. Um, I'm going to basically, uh, so basically the objective of this session, we have 50 minutes together and we're going to be talking about how the pandemic has impacted on justice of children 
and identify concrete approaches to justice uh, for children, strengthening justice for children in the COVID um, pandemic. Um, so in terms of just the background, I just wanted to highlight and remind all of us that justice for children is actually and has been since 2012 a core part of the the minimum standards for child protection in humanitarian se settings and it continues to be part of the revised edition as you can see here in um, standard number 20. But the question we're going to be asking today is have we done justice to the inclusion of justice for children for the minimum standards? Do we give it enough of uh, emphasis in our humanitarian response and if not what more could be done. Um, so the agenda today is that we'll be looking at um, uh, start with an introduction to the impact of COVID um, on justice for children. Um, we'll have a panel discussion with our key panelists, uh, presenters, uh, Marta, Cedric and Guillaume on the key actions uh, that they've taken in relation to, to addressing justice for children um, in the pandemic and the challenges that remain. And then we'll be talking, uh, uh, having a small group discussion, looking at recommendations and a plenary report back and um, some summary and conclusions. So in relation to that, I just want to highlight, we, we, may, we will have um, some logistics. So you've seen already in the first sessions that you'll be assigned to breakout groups randomly. We may have a few less than six, but you'll have be asked to use the Jamboard to discuss and share um, your ideas in small groups. We'll also have a Mentimeter, which has already been shown. Um, uh, and then we'll ask you to identify a reporter to report back. Um, you'll receive a one minute notice for the closing of the breakout rooms and we'll report back um, on the discussions you have in, in the breakout rooms in, using the chat function in plenary. So just to remind, uh, remind us a few introductory remarks from my side. As I mentioned before, the standard for justice for children that's highlighted in, uh, above here in the minimum standards is that it really talks about the importance of how all children in contact with formal and informal justice systems during the humanitarian crisis are treated in a child-friendly, non-discriminatory manner in, in line with international norms and standards and receive uh, services tailored to their specific needs and best interests. And in the, in the standard on, on justice for children, it has three core elements. The first one is really our obligation as humanitarian actors to contribute even in the midst of, an, uh, of a humanitarian crisis to strengthening the legal framework and the implementation of, of, of legal, um, legal standards to protect children. The second one is looking at strengthening access to justice for ch children who are in need of it. That includes children's victim of violence, but also very importantly, um, family justice, including issues around alternative care, um and and care arrangements for children and lastly but not not least is protecting children in conflict with the law so the standard covers these three elements so now i would like if if we can to put up the uh jessica if you can uh, repost the um mentimeter and everybody could respond to the mentimeter um in terms of uh how in, from your perspective and your experience, how has the pandemic impacted on how children come into contact with the justice system? And we'll take a few moments for, for colleagues to input that. And if Jessica, you could put that, the responses up, uh, screen that immediately so that people can see the responses coming in. That'd be great. <laughs> Everybody just has a chance. I'll I'll start to maybe if you could. So one of, some of the responses we'll see here: um, children have been victim of mob justice uh, when connect when connected to bad youth groups. Arrests on the on the basis of spreading fake news. Longer detention as court has been closed because of the pandemic. 
less access to justice for children, being a victim of, of child abuse uh, and violence. Um, access to justice has become harder and non-existent. The impact has been strong. The lack of, sorry, release of children from, from detention to reduce overcrowding in emergency environments. So there's a positive impact. Children are facing detention um, at the police station. Um, the impact has been strong. The lack of response from the justice system towards children has been predominant factor and arrested due to illegal status. Okay. Great. So we just check, I think, feel free to continue uh, in some countries. Sorry, some of the, we just wait for the last one to screen up. Okay, and the last one. Cut off from the world and forced to stay in childcare institutions in, in isolation. Some of the children are being released due to fear of COVID infection as they are placed in, 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 in crowding. I assume that means overcrowding. Great, so now what we're going to do, if we can just now, um, I will just share my screen again. Thanks, Jessica, feel free to um, continue to put those, your ideas in the chat box as we go. And great. Okay, so now what we're going to do is that we're going to have a, a discussion with some of our panelists. So if I can just start, first of all, with Marta. So if you can say, um, respond to the question, um, what concrete actions have been implemented in the countries in which you've been involved in to improve the way in, just, in which uh, children experience justice? Over to you, Marta. Thank you, Amanda. So indeed, it was very interesting to see a little bit um, the comments in the Mentimeter. I think we all agree that while uh, the COVID pandemic uh, has brought challenges, but definitely has been also bringing opportunities. I would like to highlight some, a couple of examples in which we've been involved, um, both organizations, um, and that we, we really can see a way to improve justice uh, from some of the examples that have taken place already. So for example, uh, highlighting one of the countries in which we operate, Mali, with of course, a, a, you know, a, a little bit of a um, fragile justice system, but indeed when the pandemic started and it was a need to release children from detention because of course the, the contamination was very high and the conditions at the detention centers in which children are placed are, are, were not really great even before the, the pandemic. So we've been advocating for, for some time to have interdisciplinary committees because we know it's not about only justice actors, but also child protection, social actors, and also civil society members. And then very quickly, uh, we were able with uh, all of them to set up a sort of an interdisciplinary office at the High Judicial Council with child protection counselors, with social workers, with one psychologist, and also with civil, uh, local civil society uh, organizations that were providing alternatives to attention to children. They come with a protocol on how they were gonna coordinate very quickly in order to assess which cases could be released from the detention centers. And we, we wanted to highlight this example because it, it seems it could be seen as a very easy example, but indeed the interdisciplinary coordination remains key to ensure that reintegration of children, release of children from detention happens in an appropriate way with a, a few actors involved, and especially from justice slash social welfare, child protection sectors. So that has brought a protocol, has brought an interdisciplinary coordination, and now what is happening in Mali is like the cases of children are better assessed, from a range of professionals and this this is an opportunity that we've seen only when the COVID-19 pandemic um, broke in, into the country as in others. Um, so just a good example to reflect and we will be you know looking forward to listen to other examples in other countries. I would like also to highlight the example of Jordan in which we, we also operate for a number of years and we've been supporting the child justice system. That was a very interesting example because Jordan has a legislation that is allowing for the, um, for the system of alternatives to attention to children. But since the law was approved in 2014, was not in place. I mean, law enforcement was not happening. Alternatives to detention were not in place. The COVID pandemic came to the country and it was, of course, a need to also look for ways to not have crowded detention facilities. 
and um, it was really an experience to put in place an alternative to the tension system through quite rapid mechanisms not perfect but still uh, with a lot of political willingness to, to do it and we've seen in these um, five months uh, not only the engagement of, of um, community-based alternatives because access was prevented but also we've seen uh, the installation of an alternative to a detention system in Jordan where now there is a debate on how to improve also the data of children that are remaining in detention where we are participating in debates on how to link case management systems in a way that can better support children. So this has been brought because of the pandemic and of course remains an opportunity to keep working on that. So I'll stop here to also give the floor to my colleagues. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mata, for those really concrete and very inspiring examples. I'll now turn to Cedric. Um, Cedric, would you like to add of any other concrete actions that you would like to share in terms of the 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 ways in which you've been so you've seen countries respond to this uh, COVID situation? Over to you. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, indeed, during the lockdown, we start to have a, a look on the different national response to COVID uh, for children, the pride of liberty. And that we started uh, a study with um, the law firm Baker McKenzie um, and the pro bono department of this uh, organization to help us to identify in different countries all over the world uh, the answers of the justice system um, that have been uh, implemented for, for children deprived of liberty. And we found basically uh, four main challenges, uh, which are um, for the first one, or could we um, release children from detention and uh, favor their return in the family? Um, so uh, we decided to, to, uh, to launch a campaign on accelerate release of children deprived of liberty in time of COVID-19. And that was inspired by this first question, or that is possible at uh, local level and what the justice system have been implementing. Another uh, challenge that we uh, identified was to um, uh, define all countries have been uh, trying to limiting the placement of children in detention during the, the um, uh, during the, the, the pandemic. Uh, so that started from the, you know, uh, security forces, uh, implementation of diversionary measures, or, or just uh, having a, um, a longer um, um, waiting time before the, the trial. Uh, we had uh, identified uh, different uh, cases all over the world. The last, the, the third one was about um, uh, the facilities which uh, remain open and to identify uh, what, uh, what were the protocols or the uh, procedures that have been developed locally uh, to uh, reduce the risk of uh, virus spreading. And I, I speak there, uh, we were interested in, in good practices in, in particular, as we not, um, noticed that in several countries, children were victim of double victimization, as uh, they were in self-isolation uh, solitary confinement while being in detention uh, for a um, health uh, reason. And then the last one was a different um, protocols as well developed by the countries to uh, uh, ensure mental health and physical health of children. So that gave us the idea of developing some uh, very concrete um, uh, practical uh, tools for professional, operational guidelines for professional on or could we continue exercising our uh, activities in this uh, adverse time? So we developed three, uh, mainly three documents um, of our security forces, uh, legal professionals, and uh, social workforce in collaboration with uh, IBCR, Penal Reform International, International Association of Family Judges and Magistrates. And with those documents that I invite you to, um, uh, to check, um, and that could be useful for the discussion just after, in a way, what, what we try to do is to imagine how could we create for the future resilient justice system. 
Great, thank you so much, Cedric. That was really, uh, really interesting to see how you've concretely supported the frontline workers who are really the ones who make a difference in, in, in children's everyday lives. So fantastic for that. Um, can I now just hand over to Guillaume in terms of any additional uh, uh, examples or experiences you'd like to highlight um, that have been quite effective? Over to you, Guillaume. All right, thank you, Amanda. Maybe I'll add just a word to say uh, the context is, is very intriguing and has got the double potential of, of seeing um, formidable and unique opportunities to change the way actors in the justice systems are used to address cases where um, children are in contact with the law. So we, we've seen, uh, like in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Honduras, in Burkina Faso, countries where for decades we've tried to advocate in favor of uh, diversion strategies, alternative to detention, trying to uh, in, instill procedures that are truly multi-sectoral and bring on behalf of the best interest of the child, collaborative modes of operation between the social workforce, the security forces, and the justice personnel. And now this pandemic has created an urge, a need from the point of view of those actors to actually coordinate their works, to decrease the risk that they themselves face by interacting with their children, with these children, but also anticipate potential risk of further contamination by putting uh, children at risk in various facilities or conditions during their interaction with children, with the justice system, sorry. So this has been formidable as an accelerator, but it also brought risks so that if that window of opportunity is there and we seize it, but we fail to successfully reintegrate children and being careful so that it's done in a child-friendly way and the reintegration is sustainable, then we will uh, have a backlash where people will have will use that uh, situation to illustrate uh, that the system does not work and the best place um, is to keep children in detention. So there is um, a, um, a stress and the need to uh, provide evidence that the impact that alternative to detention uh, brings for the better of children. And um, in some cases we've been successful, but we had to face also very rapid decision-making processes uh, where uh, we, we were more responsive than proactive. So luckily with time, we've been sort of more successful in anticipating what are the critical conditions for the successful of those operations. So formidable opportunities, lots of risk at the same time, but worth paying attention and professionalizing our intervention in that regard. Excellent, thank you very much. So maybe now staying with you, Guillaume, we can move to the se second question, which is really about what are the remaining challenges um, that need to be addressed? Uh, and you, you touched on a few of them, so over to you. Um, maybe I will emphasize um, looking at security forces and diversion. Diversion is a component of um, our toolkit, our resources to try to um, uh, reduce the burden on the justice system and keep the justice system active on the most uh, significant cases. In many countries, especially those with heritage from the legal perspective from the French and Spanish colonial period, um, diversion is not um, a method of operation that is uh, well in, um, integrated in the way justice systems operate. And in particular, the opportunity for security forces to have room for maneuver and make decisions so that they decide quickly to divert cases and work on alternative for a learning experience and avoid recidivism is, uh, recidivism is uh, limited. So um, the pandemic has brought uh, to light the potential for diversion to be much more sort of intelligently used by the system, especially by the security forces. Um, yet this is not something you just create and instill by um, amending the law or in introducing a, a rapid procedures. It's a change of culture. And that's a significant challenge that at the same time, we need to look at the immediate short-term opportunity, but also the structural change that needs to happen in medium term as well. Excellent, thank you very much. So maybe I'll turn to Cedric to add from your perspective, Cedric, um, what kind of challenges have you seen that we still uh, need to address going forward? 
I think what is interesting, it's um, as well for the legal professional, and I will say uh, mainly in uh, what is happening in court. Uh, so before uh, that the child uh, been sentenced um, to a measure of deprivation of liberty or, or an alternative measure. And at the moment we saw um, a lot of question, uh, ethical question about the use of technology for uh, magistrates. Um, could we continue using um, um, new technologies such as today Zoom or Skype or anything else secured to manage uh, getting uh, a distance audience? Or is that a problem of, um, of, um, of uh, security of data, etc.? That is a lot of question that even in uh, the most developed countries that are on top of the agenda. And I think that show all the legal system sometimes has difficulty uh, to adapt to a difficult situation. Excellent, thank you very much. Now I'll turn to Marta for your reflections on this question. Any additional challenges that you'd like to highlight? Right, yeah, thank you, Amanda. Just on top of what my colleagues were saying, I think uh, when we talk about justice for children, sometimes we tend to forget what happened with victims and witness. I think uh, for us uh, has been also a little bit the, the ones that has been a little bit hidden in this or in these debates about COVID pandemic and uh, justice for children. So a note to also take into account them because they were partaking in process that suddenly has been cut with no um, possibility and colleagues were reflecting on that, no access to, to justice, no, no access to process and not mechanisms for them to participate meaningfully in those process. And, and the last point that is connected to the, to the first one, but it, it is for, for all the children that partake in justice is, let's not forget that we need to find mechanisms to ensure that child participation happens in justice, even though we, we don't have face-to-face uh, -face meaning. So it was a pending, uh, still a pending uh, issue to address before the pandemic. And now we have the duty to incorporate in a different way how we will ensure child participation when we talk about justice for children. Excellent. Thanks, Marta. So I think the three of you have really highlighted a number of key challenges um, that we need to address, as well as uh, extraordinary opportunities um, in terms of the, the window of opportunity for reform, structural reform, and reform in terms of the culture um, in, uh, of how we really protect children, both uh, through the justice system, both uh, victims and witnesses, but also, of course, children in conflict with the law. And of course, we also um, need to remember that this, this, co this, uh, the COVID has also impacted on on children who are in immigration-related detention. Um, so as UNHR, we've been working very closely on that. We'll be talking a bit more about that in the next session. Um, so thank you very much for those important uh, reflections from our, from our speakers. What we're going to do now in terms of process is we're going to break you into, into small groups. Um, in the, and then you will be, have opportunities to really reflect on the key questions. I'm just going to put the key questions up again. Um, if I can just get a, get a confirmation from the producer before we go into the groups, um, can we just be sure that the, once they're in the groups, they will have access to the key questions, Jessica? Um, they won't be able to see that, but I can put them on this document. Okay. If you can please add those key questions so people can see them when they're, when they're in the groups. Um, and basically you'll have, I'm just checking the... You will have approximately, um, you'll have about 12 minutes um, in your small groups to discuss these key questions. Um, and what would be great is if you could start each of the, if you could start with the discussion of who would be the report back. Um, in fact, we might bring you back into for, uh, after about 10 minutes, but if you could just discuss who would be a reporter and make sure that that person takes some notes because we'll be asking for a reporter from each of the group to report back your main findings from each of the groups in the chat. Um, and if you could just start with the first question. Um, Jessica, do they have two jam boards in each of the available or do they have to put both answers on, on one jam board? If you could just it's just one. Them. It's just one jam board. Um, no, actually, can. They can just scroll to the second. Okay. You can okay. make another. 
Yeah. So if I can just ask everybody to answer the first question on the first sheet of your Jamboard and the second question on the second sheet of the Jamboard. So we'll, we'll come in and give you a reminder when it's time to move towards a second question. So Jessica, it'd be great if you could put people in the small groups now. Sure. So just to clarify, if everyone could click on that link that starts docs.google.com before you go to the breakout room and I'll put you in. And then Amanda, can you just share the questions and I'll add them to the doc? Yes, I will. And I might just move some people because it's not. Actually, I think Jessica, they can all see the, the, the questions still in the chat, right? Even when they're in the group. Um, I don't think they'll see that. Okay. I've added it to Google Doc, so. Okay, I still see a couple of participants here with us. Is anyone struggling to get into a group or have you just, some people may have decided not to join? <laughs> so if I can just ask Martin and Guillaume to stay here. Yeah, no problem. Great. I see two people who haven't moved yet, Jessica. Yeah, I think they must have just decided not to okay. accept the image. Okay, so what I thought it would be great to do is Martin and Guillaume, if you could join one of the, how many breakout rooms do we have? I, Jessica, no. I'd asked if, if we could be able to be co-hosts so that they, we could move between the different groups, the presenters. You should be able to do that. Okay, so you I was just, accept, go ahead. Accept the invitation to the group I put you in and then you can move around using, at the bottom you'll see breakout rooms, you should be able to move around the groups. Okay. Can I just double check before that Martha, Guillaume and, and uh, Cedric are not in the same breakout room? I'm in the um, first one. This is Guillaume. Yeah, right. you should be fine in that one. And then Cedric's in room three. And I can't see you, Martha, where are you? Can you see which one you've been invited yeah, to? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I cannot hear anything in uh, going to group four and there is no any interaction so uh, sh should you just write answer can you send me again that group uh, group four yeah i can what was your name sorry uh, and now was it um, I, I think it says to you that you're not joined so you need to accept yeah, the invitation I... click breakout rooms at the bottom an invitation should pop up Did that work? Um, yes, he's in there now. Amanda, do you want to join? You, uh, you were invited into room four. Yeah, I just didn't accept it. But Guillaume, if you want to go to your room and just help facilitate the conversation, that'd be great. Okay, thanks. But Jessica, okay. just before we move, I just want to check the timing that we're still okay, that yeah. we're bringing them back from the discussions at 1647, right? Sure, so another five minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, I can join the group if you can send that to me. I'll give them a, a yeah, one minute warning. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. How do I see the join the group? Um, if you go to the bottom where it says breakout rooms, if you click on that, you should be able to then. Okay. Then do it. And then you can move around as well. I can move around. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I see Guillaume in that one. And two, three. Maybe I will join room five. I don't see so many people there. Yeah, I can move you to five. Yeah.
it's I think that that group is that I was in I was in group five right Jessica yes you were Amanda they were writing on on Jamboard four <laughs> <It's> okay <laughs> and I think everyone was uh, people are still getting used to the technology so I think they're like somehow the technology is getting in the way of the discussion. So I said, just have a discussion and then report back to yeah. us. It doesn't matter how you use the technology, no? Yeah, well, at least you've only got five groups. One of them had 60, 60 groups with all different jam boards. 60, oof. Yeah, okay. I think they would use that. Okay, I'm gonna bring everyone back now. Is it time already? Yeah, but they just have a minute to come back. Give me, okay, I just get some water. Okay, quickly. Hi guys, welcome back. We're just waiting for everyone to trickle back in. They still have 20 seconds, Amanda, before they're properly picked out. Okay. And Cedric, I see you online. If we have time, we'll also, I'll also open it up for questions to you from the participants if, we, if we're able to finish a little earlier because we're going quite quickly. I think that would be, um, that would be a helpful thing to do. Yeah, no problem. Everyone is back now, Amanda. Okay, welcome back everyone. Let me just check. Uh, so what we wanted to do is just hear a few, if everyone can, every we the reporters, if you're able to basically put your some of your uh, responses in the chat box. And while you're putting your responses in the chat box, I'm going to go through the questions with and, and ask for a few uh, reflections from each of the 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 group leaders just while we get those in the chat box so can everybody see the chat box yeah yes great okay yes. excellent yes. so group one if you could group one who was the reporter from group one okay Lots of answers to the Jamboard on the Jamboard here. I can capture uh, maybe on behalf of the two ideas for group one that has emerged. Would that be a good idea? That'd be great. Please go ahead, Gil. Okay. Maybe a good example from Iraq uh, saying access um, is being really challenged, their access to justice and um, maybe highlighting the situation of children associated with armed groups and armed forces also. Um, and so the suspension of face-to-face -face activities, the imposition of curfew, lockdown, has really reduced the space to address and support the cases of those children within the justice system. Um, but it was uh, interesting to see the experience of advocating for uh, with the Ministry of Health to have alternative places for to provide uh, services and care for such children. Um, another example from South Sudan, IRC, talking about um, uh, over 100 release of children from um, a reformery center. But uh, what was interesting is the restriction in movement prevented from um, accompanying those children back home. So they needed to find the interim care services and coordinate with actually the community of interest working with children in armed conflict to see how those interim, interim care services can be open um, to uh, take care of those children while uh, in limbo between their release and their return to their community. Good example of collaboration with UNICEF, the government um, to expand those services, um, linking case management uh, between um, different systems of the child protection system has been a challenge and um, two key challenges, lack of data of how many children are left in detention and lack of capacity to follow up on in individual cases once the children are released. There we go. 
Excellent. Great. Thanks for being in that group. Just remind me which group were you in, Gil? The best one. What can I say? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the first one. <laughs> okay, group one. Great. Thank you. So maybe from group two, were there any reporter back who wanted to add from group two? Sure. Uh, this is Katie uh, Sussman. I will just say on the sort of positive side, um, children's cases in Ethiopia and in Zimbabwe were given um, priority um, in the justice system. Um, and in some cases in Ethiopia, for example, children in prison had been released, including those imprisoned with their mothers. Um, and then on sort of the challenges side, um, the access to uh, procedures and services were all delayed in Europe and North America, for example. So that affected um, children in um, Northern Central America um, that were potentially being deported or returned. It also affected them being able to access um, international justice processes, um, including asylum. Um, that's all, thank you. Great, great. Group three? Anyone from group three? Like to report back? I think I, I, think yeah. I was in group three, yeah? Are there someone else? <laughs> three? Oh. Yes, uh, this is... Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, in uh, group three, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, just a minute. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. Uh, do you have, if now is not a good moment, we can always come back to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, let's go, move to group four now. Yeah, um, we had a little bit of tech issues with Jamboard, so couldn't discuss much, but um, as an achievement, uh, as uh, already mentioned from some of the groups, like release of children from detention centers, as well as reunification of children with families. Um, but on the other side, uh, as a challenge, um, we still have some logistic barriers for children to access to justice. So for example, lack of information for children in the detention centers, and also lack of access to technology like uh, internet or phone. So for example, children don't have phone or don't have access to internet so that they cannot report um, their issues or um, why being abused or being involved in any other crimes. They have no or limited access to report such kind of things. So um, less access to justice eventually. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Ma Manami. Manami, thank you. Actually, you were in group five, but no problem. Oh. It's, it's good to mix things up a bit. So I'm going to, going to head to group four. Um, I think Marta, you were in that group. Yeah, I was, I was in that group, sorry, Jessica, you were right. Um, sorry for the confusion of, uh, of the groups. I'm just going to add a couple of ideas, but there were also other people that they maybe want to, to join. We were also, one of ideas that is important to me, and we were briefly commenting, is like, there, there are more children in contact with the law because of the pandemic. So we need to have this into account. There are those that are in conflict because of curfew rules, those that are not well reintegrated because they don't have the service, and therefore, Redivism is more likely to happen. So I think it's a powerful message. It's an important, it's an important and vulnerable group of children that we, we should be supporting because indeed we do have opportunities, but what we have is more children coming into contact with the law. I let also my, my you know, the other people of the group to, to join, but that for me was really an important element to highlight. Yeah. Great, thanks so much, Mata. I, I, um, uh, I will ask colleagues in the interest of time, if anyone has anything to add, I'll ask them to, from your group. Yeah, actually, to yeah, actually Ma uh, Marta already uh, explained what we discussed in our group four. So we are talking about the reintegration. So reintegration means 
properly the integration uh, with uh, some options and we were also talking about the 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 issue of the civil documentation that is related to uh, citizenship birth registration and that is uh, being suspended by by the government in iraq uh, for quite a long time during this this pandemic right excellent Thanks, thank you thank you so much and now i think back to group 3 I, I can do it if Frida, Frida, are you there? Or Cedric? Why don't you go ahead, Natalie? We seem I was to be trying, I was trying not to <laughs> because Please I'm going to be presenting it. Um, so I think, I um, mean, our group had quite a depth of experience. So we went straight onto the um, Jamboard and a lot of information was put there, which includes um, some of the things that have already been raised, which is a lot of children getting released. Um, and also um, a lot of reflection on analysis and policies and procedures, increasing advocacy with governments, um, responding to children cases as quick as possible, uh, use of technology um, for court, uh, so virtual courts were a new thing, um, increase in diversion, more involvement of community and faith leaders, um, and an increase asked by the justice system to improve capacity. So they were coming to, to our partners um, to try and get their capacity built. Some of the areas where people are, are still talking about, which is one is the increases um, in children coming in contact with the law, um, which was just mentioned before, but also increases in violence in the, in the home and community, which also means um, we need a justice system that is child friendly and, and friendly to, to women and children um, and has that GBV lens as well. Uh, strengthening community um, and children led preventative messages, measures were also talked about, increasing legal aid, um, there's a need, a huge funding gap for justice for children in emergencies. This is an area that has received much funding during COVID. Um, need to link to other pillars of the child protection system, especially social welfare services, um, increasing diversion, uh, timely identification, making sure those tools are already available. Um, and the technology divide was also there. Oh, increasing social workers as well within the justice sector to access families and children. Excellent, Natalie. It sounds like you had a really rich discussion. So that has been an incredible, uh, I mean, I can't believe that the, we're almost out of time. We have two minutes before, um, but I will hand it over to my presenters. Uh, first, Guillaume, then Marta, and then Cedric for final closing remarks. Over to you, Guillaume. All right. Maybe it's interesting the pandemic is, is 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 bringing a common um, lens on a problem that existed in other type of emergency is the lack of, of I would say willingness to connect it's it's an intention right from donors and agencies to make uh, justice for children a priority in the emergency response it's a challenge to convince donors to to make it um, uh, receivable and pressing among others sort of concerns in the midst of an emergency, but it's also a challenge internally in our agencies to advocate to create that nexus and make sure that it's, um, it's preeminent. So yet again, the pandemic is demonstrating on the one hand the potential, but the difficulties in, in making it happen. So I think we, we need to grow the community of interest to, to, to transform that interest into a commitment. Great, thank you. And now over to Marta. Yes, yeah, thank you. A very quick message, uh, a, little, a little bit what Guillaume was saying is like sometimes we face difficulties to, to portray justice in emergencies and we were calling this presentation now is the time because we, we feel that there is an opportunity to really reform the justice in a way that can also be quick and rapid and responding to the needs of children. And, and for me, the, the last message is let's not forget that those children are in contact with the law, but they are coming from a, a story and they also have needs and they should not be excluded when we talk about, you know, child protection. They're a very specific group that requires needs, very specific, and that have a story and, and requires some attention, even in emergencies. Great, thank you. And uh, now, lastly, but not leastly, over to Cedric. Yes, thank you. Um, I tend to be uh, always a little bit too much positive and uh, even with the COVID-19, I will have a, a positive comment to finish this session. 
uh, which is quite difficult to be frank. But what I've learned is that, in fact, justice system can deal with decongestion, with reducing the number of kids in detention. I think we should learn from that. If it's possible for the pandemic, it might be possible in normal circumstances. So I hope we will find again the way to get to final, uh, to a normal situation again. But we should learn from that and try to get uh, as much as children in alternative programs and less in deprivation of liberty. Great, thank you for those very um, insightful concluding remarks. Just to wrap up, I'm just going to share my screen because what we have for you is a, we have a number of, many of you probably already know these, but I just wanted to share with you the last, uh, the key res a list of some of the key resources that we have in terms of, um, that has been developed. You can find the video presentation from this session by our colleagues um, at the link here. We also have, of course, the minimum uh, standards justice, uh, standard number 20. And of course, n uh, the technical note on COVID and children deprived of their liberty. So thank you so much for joining. We have a small break now until uh, 10 past, but we have, for those of you who are really, you know, passionate gurus about justice, we have another session with Natalie and I about justice for children. So we hope that you might, some of you might join us there. Thank you very much. And we'll see you in the next session very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Amanda. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Hi, Jessica, just checking my audio again. Yeah, you're good, Amanda. I'm just popping out one minute. Yeah, me too. Okay, great.
Hi everyone, while we're waiting, we'll get started in two minutes. Sorry, I just need to put on my video. So could I just, uh, if you were in the previous, I see 20 of you here with us already. Um, if you were in the previous session on justice, could you just put it in the chat? Because we just need to check if we need to adjust the, 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 the plan at all. So if you were in the previous session in justice, could you just put it in the chat or, or say yes in the, put a little tick. Okay. Great, you see a couple of you were in the previous session. If you were not in the previous session, can you just uh, tick the thing that says no? I hope everyone can see that. And the two of you who were previous session, if you could just tick the little yes. So we'd like to see a response from everyone who's here with us. Yes or no, were you in the previous session on justice? Yes, can you mute? Um, honey, can you do that because um, he's currently host? Okay, honey, if you can mute people, that'd be great. Okay, so I see a few people. Great, thank you very much for putting it, putting it in the chat. If you can also say, use the, in addition to the chat, if you can also just try, and this is just an opportunity for those of us who are, who are waiting for everybody to come on board. If you could just use the little tick arrows to say yes or no, were you in the previous session? If you see the little yes or no arrows next to your name, you can raise your hand. There should be yes or no um, above the chat. You could all just put a, a tick or a cross so we can get a visual sense of that. That'd be great. Okay. Seems that there were a few people in the last session, but not so many. Great. Okay. So I think we can get started. You don't, so maybe not all of you have the, that option. Jessica, would everybody have the little uh, tick, yes or no on there? I think they, they will if they have the updated um, Zoom, but maybe okay. not everyone. Okay. They should have. Yeah, great. So if we can just get started, um, thank you very much for joining. Uh, apologies for those of you, the few of you who were in the previous session with, with me, um, but I'm going to be again your facilitator for this session um, on justice for children. And here we're going to be focused in the previous session on justice for children. We looked broadly at justice for children with an emphasis on children deprived of their liberty and in conflict with the law, but we looked broadly at the issue of um, justice for children, including, um, you know, access to justice for child uh, victims and witnesses, as well as um, children in conflict with the law. And this session, we're really going to delve down into the specificities of um, children who are uh, deprived of their liberty. Um, and so I'm just going to share my screen. Sorry, just one second. My screen, you can see everything that Okay, here we go. Great. So I'm just going to move that over there. Okay, so welcome to this session. We we'll just do a quick round of introductions before we get started. So my name's Amanda Melville. Um, I am actually, I should need to stop sharing, otherwise you won't see my face. So um, I am a senior child protection advisor for UNHCR. And um, we'll just ask if Natalie, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Natalie McCauley and I'm the Chief of Child Protection for UNICEF Bangladesh. Great. So Natalie and I will be the, the Australian dream team in case you didn't know <laughs> our accents Sorry. Um, together with you on this session. Mm. Um, okay, great. So let me just share my screen again. I'm going to get Do we have you. a translator for Australians? <laughs> Do we have that available, Steve? You've got to sort that out. <laughs> it, was, it was too expensive. <laughs> Honey. No worries, mate. We couldn't afford all the beer. <laughs> okay. So now if I can just start the slide. Okay, great. Um, so Jessica, can I just confirm that everyone can see the slideshow now? Yes, they can. Great. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm going to move this little, maybe I can get rid of that. 
Okay. So um, what is the objective of the session? So we're going to be looking again at what is the, how is the, the pandemic impacted on the situation of children deprived of liberty? We're going to identify concrete approaches to protect children uh, deprived of liberty during COVID and identify opportunities to use the pandemic to build back better. And this was a common theme from the previous session and we'll be um, with Natalie exploring again together in the context specifically of Bangladesh, um, how, how UNICEF and the partners have been able to use the pandemic as an opportunity to really um, accelerate the investments around the reform um, of uh, children in conflict with the law. Okay, the agenda uh, will be, as we mentioned, really an introduction to the impact of children deprived of liberty um, and, and the impact of COVID. Uh, we'll be looking at the case study, as I mentioned, together with Natalie of the situation in Bangladesh. And again, we'll be doing some lovely small group work and, and plenary report back with some summary and conclusions. So that's it. Um, we will look at the number, we have about 30 of us today. so. Um, we'll probably have a few less Jamboards uh, than we, sorry, a few less uh, breakout rooms uh, than we initially said, but it'll be the same process that you've already seen. So I won't go through that in, 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 in detail. So in terms of the issue, just a few opening remarks from my side. So who are children deprived of liberty? It's very important to think, I mean, there's many ways to, many aspects to children deprived of liberty, but broadly speaking, we can talk about three categories. First, you have children who are in conflict with the law. And those are children who have um, committed or alleged to have committed some, some crime. Then you have the situation of children in immigration detention. And obviously that is a situation where children and, and sometimes their family are placed in detention because of immigration related um, offences. Um, and the last one is children detained without due, due process. So in many of the places where we work, we actually have the detention of children absolutely unrelated to, to any due legal process. Um, and so it's important for us to keep in mind that we do have that, that other category of children, those other categories. It's not just the traditional way we think about children in conflict with the law. Um, so what are key priorities? And this is the, unfortunately, and for, you can see the guidance, the technical note on COVID and children deprived of liberty, um, identify three priori key priorities for us to work to, together um, as a child protection community. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to deal with my screen. In terms of addressing and, and protecting children who are deprived of, of liberty and the key priorities that were identified in that um, guidance note that was developed back, I think in April even, first of all, was issuing a moratorium on new children entering detention facilities. The second priority was releasing all children who can be safely released. Yeah. And thirdly, is protecting yeah. the health and well-being of yeah. any children who yeah. must yeah. remain in detention. Uh, Hani, can I just ask you to mute all the participants? And just a reminder to everybody, if you could mute when you're not speaking. Thank you. Yeah, I've done that. Thanks. Great. So this is giving an, a, a quick overview of children deprived of, of liberty. Now I'm going to open up um, and really if we can just give me a second, we'll stop sharing the screen. Great. And now we'll turn, after that overview, I want to turn to Natalie. And Natalie, can you ask, could you uh, explain to us how did COVID impact on the way in which the justice system functions for children in Bangladesh? Over to you, Natalie. Yeah, thanks. Um, look, I think uh, none of us were prepared for COVID, obviously, and uh, the justice system in Bangladesh for children was already strained beforehand. Um, unfortunately, the practice in Bangladesh has been centred mostly around institutionalisation. And I think once um, COVID 
started, this didn't really stop actually. We had an increase of children going into institutions still um, in places of detention. The courts were all closed um, because of the lockdown. Um, and also we had a situation where probation officers in, in Bangladesh, probation officers are like um, social workers within the justice system. They're called probation officers. They also were unable to access the children and the legal aid um, people were also stopped. In the detention facilities themselves, they also weren't prepared. Um, they didn't, weren't prepared for virtual situations. They didn't have Zoom rooms or Skype rooms. Um, and they had, uh, and they're very far away from children's courts. So one of the pieces of legislation here is that you have to um, go to, physically go to a children's court to actually get released, put on bail or even have your trial. So that just wasn't possible in COVID and we have a very large country obviously and the three detention facilities are a long way away um, from a lot of those children's courts. Um, and the access to the families was stopped. So the visits were also stopped um, at that time. So it was quite a, a jarring event um, and uh, yeah, it was very hard to, to cope in those initial days because pretty much everything stopped, but the flow of children to those detention facilities continued. You're muted. Sorry. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. That sounds like a really challenging situation to deal with, Natalie. Could you say a few words about how did you address this situation? How did you try to respond as UNICEF and the partners to address the challenges um, you, saw, you just articulated? Well, uh, immediately um, we started negotiations or started talking with um, the Supreme Court and, and we, had a, we have a committee on child rights with the Supreme Court here. So one of the advantages for us was is that we already had that relationship and I think that helped us um, going straight into this. We were able to call that um, committee. We were able to work with the Ministry of Social Welfare, who are uh, the ones that are actually looking after all of the detention facilities, including the safe homes for children in contact with the law. Um, and we were able to solicit some joint commitments on how we can move forward, um, some acknowledgements that children are at high risk there and that's not going to make the government look good. It's not going to make anyone, it's not going to be a positive result if any of the children get sick. Um, they also had to recognise that most of the detention facilities had three or four times the amount of children um, that they had the capacity for. Uh, and that children were still flowing into the system. So we had to get that acknowledgement of the government partners first, but also we had to get the Supreme Court on board. That advocacy started from the start. And I have to say also the Alliance document um, that you noted at the start of this session was pivotal for us because it actually was a foundational document in which we could start even broader discussions. This is, you know, this is a global document. This is a, this is based on the global minimum standards. This is what we should be doing here. And so we were able to start those discussions and, and um, we were able to do it very, very quickly. We got an agreement that this was the way we needed to go, which was getting children out of detention. We started a negotiation to establish virtual courts um, and UNICEF um, supplied everything for the virtual court. So we actually did all of the support um, in establishing those virtual courts within that first month um, of the COVID lockdown. So by April, we already had the virtual courts up and running and we managed to get um, agreement at the highest level. And then the Honourable President of Bangladesh issued an ordinance to ensure that those virtual courts were legalised. Um, the first session of the virtual courts wasn't until the first week of May, um, but it's still compared to um, I mean, we've both been working in this field for 20 plus years. I mean, to have something shift so dramatically um, in such a short period of time is, is somewhat of a miracle in justice for children. So even, even in the last six months, we've had over a thousand children released from detention because of those initial advocacy. Um, and what we did notice though, that there was neglect the links to the probation officers and the social welfare systems weren't necessarily there. We have had to increase that. Um, alongside this, we were increasing the number of social workers anyway with the Ministry of Social Welfare. So this sort of went in parallel. So it was a systems-based approach and this was one component of it. Excellent, thanks. Now, it was really interesting to hear the figures that you talked about, about the number of children released. Um, yes. since COVID. What was the rate that was being, is it, how did that compare to what was happening before COVID? Could you say a few yeah, words about they that? They weren't really being released. 
<laughs> I mean, there was probably a few a month um, and, and you would get more going in, which is why they had three times the amount. So now they're at capacity, the detention facilities. Um, we've still got a lot of work to do. We need more commitment on diversion. We have that. The government is very supportive. So we've been so lucky to have great government counterparts that have been so supportive in this process, really committed to improving the rights of children. And even now the standards of children in these facilities, they recognise that the facilities are not up to standard at all. Um, not that we want children in detention at all, but we also need them to be safe when they are there. And there has been a number of incidences in the last few months that have identified that perhaps they're not necessarily safe in those facilities and it's a lot better for them to be at home. Great. So you've identified a number of remaining challenges that you have in Bangladesh and that mm. the uh, Bangladesh is, you're working together with the authorities and partners in Bangladesh. Could you say a few words about how you're you know, going forward, you're planning to address those challenges in support of the authorities. Well, in the last month, one of the biggest challenges we've had is that because things have started to open up and the courts have started to open up, there's been a reluctance to use the virtual court structure. So there's going to be an ongoing advocacy for that because we don't want children to have to go um, to another part of the country to be in front of a judge to have their rights assured. So the virtual system we want to keep because that also expedites everything that's going on. Um, there's also a need to strengthen the skills and the capacity of the judges and the lawyers and the social services, as well as the police regarding um, virtual know-how, but also the rights of these children um, to promote diversion. Uh, one of the things we were able to do within that first month was to train all of the judges across the children's courts, something that you wouldn't do usually, and it wouldn't be done very quickly, but because of the virtual opportunities, we were able to do that. So I think if we can continue to leverage that technology technology advancement, um, I think we will all be in a much better place moving forward. There's a lot of um, creative ways that you can engage very high level individuals because you don't actually have to visit them face to face. So it's allowed us to have those relationships. Um, I think also we need to continue with our legislation. The legislation we have is from 2013 and the rules associated with it have not been budgeted for, they, don't, they haven't been costed and they're not being implemented. And that has been a large gap. Um, and the rules are not just for justice for children, but also for um, children at risk of harm and, and violence against children and other areas associated with child protection. And we need to continue that upstream work. What I realise, though, is that the upstream work that sometimes is not seen much, you know, you don't see the results. It's a slow, it's a slow working machine. Um, enabled us to move so quickly in those first six weeks. If we did not have the relationship that we did at the highest levels, especially the Chief Justices of the Supreme Court, I don't think we would have been able to do what we've done. Great. Well, thank you very much. I see a question, another question, and I think oh. we do have a few minutes. So if colleagues would like to post questions to Natalie um, in in the the chat box. So one, I see a question here. Were the virtual courts established by UNICEF used for adult cases as well? Um, no. Only child <laughs> cases, yep. Only for children's courts and for children that were in safe homes. Um, but UNDP, after we established the virtual courts and we got the advocacy and the Prime Minister um, cleared the virtual courts, UNDP supported the adult court system having virtual courts. So adults were also released throughout this process as well. Okay, great. Another question I see from Alex. Have you seen more lenient sentencing with virtual courts than face-to-face -face, or were they simply far less courts than before? Well, a lot of the cases still are suspended. So it was mostly getting children out on bail or those that perhaps were on petty crimes to get the cases um, removed or reduced. So yeah, I guess in, in that case, yes, because the whole purpose of it was to get children out of detention. So yes, but not, not really in essence, it's still the same. Yeah. Okay, great. Now I see another question from Frida. Um, virtual courts have been legit, uh, legalised by the president. Uh, what would be the reason why the traditional courts would like to go back to face to face for children? Um, because that's just what they're used to. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, they're, they're, these are very senior judges. Um, 
it was quite an interesting process where they'd be calling us at all hours on how to use Zoom, um, how to use the laptops, you know, how to plug things in and get things moving, how to scan documents, those sorts of things that so that they could still abide by the law and still work, use virtual um, courts. So it's still a learning process and um, some of them are fine with it, some of them are not. So we, we have to just keep advocating. And I, I think, you know, eventually it will be something that they just use normally. Yeah, mm. they are, however, though, allowing kids to stay at the detention facility and access the court virtually, but the judge is just in session. Okay, very yeah. interesting. Another yeah. question, how did you deal with the issues of confidentiality, security, child-friendly legal aid, record keeping, et cetera? Yeah, so there was a whole process that was developed with the Supreme Court justices, um, and this included scanning of documents, um, secure uh, lines of communication, um, and courier services with, with some of the documents, but mostly it was over scan situation. Um, and they we had IT people work out um, how to do the security on the actual virtual court itself. Okay, great. Um, and I think a last question, does the virtual court also apply to a Rohingya refugee camp or do you know the situation of Rohingya children in conflict with the Leo? Okay, so in the refugee camp, they don't actually have a formalised legal process, although they're meant to be under Bangladeshi law. So, but the camp coordinators um, are the ones that usually end up deciding what to do in a case, which we're also trying to advocate for uh, a, a different system, because particularly for violence against women and children, they minimise and um, there's, a, there's an issue there for us, obviously. Um, yeah. But there were a lot of children from the Rohingya camps that have come in conflict with the law or contact with the law, some in the safe homes, um, outside of the camps, in Cox Bazaar district itself. Um, and they were they were part of this virtual system and a number of them have been now back home with their families in the camps. Okay, great. I mean, we do see that it's really important to, to advocate for, for equal access to yeah. these kind of core child protection services, including exactly. for refugees. So it's great to see that you're working together with the authorities to make progress in that area. Very important. Yeah, and we have good partnership with UNHCR here and, and, and they've been very supportive of this process too. Yeah. Excellent, thanks. Well, look, that was really fascinating, Natalie. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to launch a Mentimeter. Um, so if I can just ask, uh, if I can just ask- We all ask, love Mentimeters now. We love Mentimeters, <laughs> right? This is the new way. Um, so if I can just ask, Jessica's just put the Mentimeter in, in the chat box. If everybody could just go to the, the link to get the question. So we'll just take a moment to allow everyone, I was supposed to do it before, but I forgot, sorry. It's okay. I was so well behaved. I did really quickly. <laughs> yeah, people can still hear you, you know. <laughs> I know. But it's you like we're having a chat. Like a chat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if we can just, uh, Jessica, how are we going in terms of responses on the Mentimeter? Not very many, only three oh, people. come on. Come on, team. I'm going to start calling out names of people. Four. Oh, so they're coming in. But this, yeah, it's going up. Yeah, they don't want to be named. <laughs> Okay, we we'll just give it a few minutes. Um, of course, while we're doing that, we can also, if there's any last questions to Natalie or to myself, feel free to pop those in the chat. We'll we'll take them while people are completing the 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 Mentimeter. I did actually have one question myself, Natalie. You mentioned yeah. briefly the issue of um, of diversion. Could you say a yeah. few more words about diversion in the context of of of, of uh, Bangladesh? Well, we've seen it as an opportunity to promote diversion because um, the police don't know what to do with these kids because the probation officers aren't in a lot of the police stations at the moment um, and they don't want to be sending them to detention facilities. So we've seen that as a, another opportunity to advocate for diversion more broadly. We've developed a guideline um, and we've started training um, police officers and we've been sending messages down to the police stations. Um, we've got support for children and women help desks. Um, that was part of of the 2013 legislation. But again, because of the rules, it hasn't really been rolled out and the funding obviously 
hasn't been there. But we've got a lot more support on this and other agencies are also supporting this, like UN Women, um, UNFPA and other INGOs like SAVE and PLAN as well. So I think, you know, I think we're moving in the right direction, but um, for me, prevention is the best in, in all child protection. So early intervention, increasing social workers, making sure casework is there for these families. The kids that are getting arrested are getting arrested for um, things because associated with um, socioeconomic issues or violence at home, not having access to school. So those things can be um, worked out in case management, can be workflowed, can be prevented. Um, and with diversion, we can prevent it at another level because these families can be identified. Great. Thank you very much. So now I want to ask, yes, in fact, I didn't even have to ask. It seems that Jessica <laughs> read my mind. Thanks, yeah. Jessica. So um, are you able to make that a little bit? Ah, perfect. Okay. So now... Uh, I have the glasses on. Yeah, it's a little small. Um, I'm going to have to try to remember. So the first question is, how, how has COVID affected... Um, what are the three most important negative effects of COVID? So um, basically, it seems the biggest one is delays in judicial proceedings, um, yeah. such as longer times. So that seems to be one of, and oh, and I'm violence sorry. against and violence against sorry. children was the sorry. second one. Increase in violence. Increase in violence in all of the countries. You know. Yeah. Yeah, so we've seen those two are key elements. And, and then the pink one, you can see I'm really trying to read. Increase in children in conflict with the law due to the lack of um, in children being locked out, uh, are not able to access school or increase in, in economic issues. And then after that, we have number six, which is increase in children in, in contact with the law due to COVID testing regulations. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, sorry, number nine. Uh, that one, sorry. Deterioration. Yeah, deterioration of, of children in detention. Yeah. Okay, great. So that's what we see as some of the negative impacts. Can we move to the next question, which is more about the positive opportunities? So, um, so do P Jessica, can you just explain, do people have to go back and, and go to the, sec the same link and they'll go to the second question? Exactly, so that same link and then it should be on the second question then. Okay, great. So we just wait a moment for the second question. So I think, you know, what, it, what is interesting about this is we see neg many negative effects, but also as, as um, Natalie and our other colleagues were highlighting, uh, we see many opportunities to be able to address some of the challenges um, and opportunities uh, for very rapid and, and very structural reforms. So it's really quite a, a mixed bag, but really a, the, we see this window of opportunity if we're able to mobilize the right political will as well as the resources to be able to make a, a huge change in the lives of these children. So we see basically here the release of children. Um, yes, in terms of, this is also one of the things I think we see, it came up in your presentation, Natalie, as well as a number of other colleagues' presentations, that in fact, governments are much more willing um, and authorities are much more willing to release uh, children from COVID because I assume, and what would be your, what from your experience, Natalie, what was the reason behind that willingness from the authorities? Because of risk. Well, one, because their staff weren't turning up, so they knew the children were at more risk, so there was less staff in the detention facilities. Um, but two, they were worried that there would be an outbreak of COVID and how that, you know, the aesthetics of that, how that would look. Um, I guess for us moving forward is how do we maximise that to, for it to not just be about preventing infection rates of COVID? How do we maximise this to ensure that detention is a last resort, that this is not something that's a go-to option? Um, and that there are other options like diversion and like making sure that we have strong child protection systems and referral pathways at the community level. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, Jessica, can I just ask you to put back the, the presentation, please? The Mentimeter results? Okay.
So we see the second one is greater use of alternatives to detention. And that indeed was, was a, is, is really true. We've seen that in many countries um, around immigration detention that actually authorities are much more willing to look for alternatives to detention. And we heard that in, also in your settings and the number of presentations before as well as increased uh, political will to t address the reform of, of justice for children um, and greater attention to justice for children in the humanitarian response. I have to say in all my years of working in, in humanitarian settings, I've never seen this issue be such high profile. So I think it's a real, yeah, really opportunity for us to really tackle this. And the last one that got a lot of votes is the, obviously the increased use and of technology to improve the accessibility and, mm -hmm. and um, accessibility and, and also the quality. And coming back to, I think, something Martha mentioned in the previous session is really the importance of child participation, how bringing the justice system closer to children um, and their lives and making it more accessible really facilitates that child participation as well as the quality of the justice. So great. Thank you very much for that. What we're going to do now um, is really move towards uh, the, some small group discussion. So. Um, Jessica, I'm just going to remind people, we're going to, uh, we're going to ask pretty much the same question, which is basically what, uh, what recommendations should be made to strengthen the protection of children deprived of liberty by, um, affected by COVID? So Jessica, how many, how many groups are you going to put people into today now? Um, five, actually I might do four as a few have dropped yep. off. That would be great if you can pop people in four groups. And then um, basically, as per the previous ones, if you can use the, if you can use the, um, if you can use the, the not the chat box, if you can use the group, uh, yeah. the chat board to, yeah. sorry, the Jamboard. And then we'll also ask you, actually, we'll share with you in the groups a Mentimeter where you can actually put your, your responses in Mentimeter so that they'll be screening when we come back into the group. So great if you could move everyone now. Thanks, Jessica. So Jessica? Yeah. So just a question. Do they have access to the question in the group? Um, yeah, so I've, did you, I've done, there's Jamboards for that one. Great. And I put the question on the jam board this time. Okay, great. And then we just need to share with them in the groups the Mentimeter so they enter, they type it into the Mentimeter, their response. Yes, it's the, it's the same link, but I can just jump in and, and make sure they've got it. If you can just, so it's the same link for the Mentimeter, right? Yeah, I've just added in. It's the what recommendations should be made to strengthen the protection of children. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so I am going to go and join one of the breakout rooms and check. We see a few people still here in this group. Is that? I'm yeah, sure. you do accept the, um, the breakout room invitation. Let me know if you have any troubles. Okay, I'm going to join a group and yeah. Okay, excellent. So Jessica, yes, they are. Just, sorry. Yeah. So Natalie, if I can hand over you to you to have a look and 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 make some reflections on some of the recommendations that are coming up, is it possible to make that a little bigger, Jessica? Because it's quite hard to read. And I'm old now. I've got to wear glasses. Uh, if you make it full screen, it's everybody. If you what make I, it full screen, it's actually easier. Yeah, I think that's the best way. Or I can just zoom in. If does does that work? Yeah. Yeah. And then I can move the bit around. Yeah. So same, Elisa. It's uh, Annalisa. Sorry, it's the same uh, Mentimeter link as before. If you want to add, so. Uh, yeah, Jessica. Oh, sorry, Jessica. I see. <laughs> Uh, your name on it. Uh, so, uh, Natalie, if you'd just be able to m maybe read through some of the recommendations. That we yeah, see I can up. see here that there's, um, and when you had it on the bigger screen as well. So, Jessica, it's okay because I've got my big screen here and my little screen here. 
if you can put it back on, on yeah, this. Perfect. Okay, so I can see that there was a couple of different ones that were talking about data analysis um, and looking at uh, children that are detained and what's the makeup of those children. I think that's a really important one, particularly in regards to looking at um, possible prevention um, options for us, but also divert them from the proper system. Um, there's also ensuring authorities do not use arbitrary um, procedures, um, making sure that we use the highest level of, of government to ensure pardons and that petty cases are expedited. Um, looking at individual case management, ensuring we increase individual case management, making sure we have strong relationships um, with uh, juvenile justice actors. Um, for us in Bangladesh, that has to be at the highest level. Um, working on adaptation of the justice system, um, COVID context with state actors and non-state actors, ensuring that, uh, oh, I already did that one. I already did that one. Okay, so it just keeps flowing up. That's lovely. So then if I miss <laughs> things, it comes back. We love the metameter. Yeah, so I think I think it's I think we're done, right? Did I get it? Sorry, I didn't get a way to stop it scrolling like that. It's just the way <laughs> it is. No problem. Uh, okay, so we're all learning. It's all a journey on learning how to do all of these kind of uh, things online. So I think that we actually have a few minutes. If colleagues would like to, from the different groups, we can just hear some um, some additional reflections or thoughts, and we'll t basically take a take a moment to go around each of the groups. So let's so start with. Can I just raise something? Because something really critical in our in our session was coming up at the end, and he got cut off. Thomas, are you still there? Um, so Thomas works in South Sudan, and he was saying that his system um, of justice is obviously needs strengthening, like all of the systems. Um, and I imagine also virtual access was not really possible. But he said that one, they've only got one detention facility, um, and how we can increase the detention facilities um, so that more kids can have access to detention, but I guess better facilities because one detention facility is overrun. Um, I guess we all know that obviously detention is a last resort and we want to promote diversion. That's, that's the way we want to go. So we want to increase um, the systems at the preventative side so we can increase diversion. But we also need to ensure that children are safe in, in these facilities. If you've only got one facility or two facilities and there's too many kids in there and they're not looking too good, you can start advocating for diversion and for community-based options. You can use that as a catalyst, um, just like COVID. You can twist it to use it as a catalyst for saying, this is why detention is not going to work because we can't get money to help you to build another one. That's not an option. So let's, these are some options that have been done in other places. Let's get the kids out of here. Um, and that's definitely worked in other countries. Um, I know that it's definitely worked in the Philippines. It has certainly worked in Sudan in some locations and some parts of the Pacific it has worked as well in the past. But it's been a development approach rather than an emergency. Yeah. I don't know if Thomas wanted to Thanks. add to that. Yeah. I, I see Thomas here. Thomas, would you like to add? Uh, all right, uh, okay. Uh, in South Sudan, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, from South Sudan IRC. Uh, in South Sudan, uh, there is uh, only one uh, juvenile center uh, that can uh, uh, serve for uh, children or any uh, under 18 children. Uh, in most of the location out of that, uh, that center is in uh, the main uh, capital city in Juba. But uh, in the other locations uh, where uh, there are uh, children with, uh, in contact uh, with law, uh, they are detained together with the adults. There is no separate uh, space uh, to uh, accommodate them. So they uh, detain them together with the adults. Uh, there, there are so many uh, child protection issues uh, raised uh, even in those centers. Uh, so while we uh, strengthening or improving uh, this uh, the, uh, justice system for children, uh, we need to consider uh, the capacity building of uh, the local or the government or justice system. Uh, that, that would be uh, one of uh, my uh, point. 
The other one is at least uh, if, if uh, the government continue uh, detaining uh, those uh, children with, uh, in conflict with uh, law, uh, at least it's good to have a separate space uh, for those kind of uh, uh, situation. The other one is uh, there is no uh, child-friendly uh, court uh, system or so it's, it's also one of uh, the advocacy area that we uh, need to focus on. Yeah, these are some of my addition. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. Excellent. I, I think that's a good idea. Like focus on the capacity building at that local level and improving, improving the facilities there. Yeah. Excellent. So now if I can just ask uh, anybody else from any of the other groups would like to volunteer to add. We have about three minutes um, before we need to make some concluding wrap up uh, statements. Uh, I see can Hannah. I just please go ahead. Yeah, uh, in our group, we were also discussing to think something about uh, building capacity of the juvenile justice uh, authorities. Uh, maybe it is not necessary that all the, the, the competent authority, they know about the children's right and different contexts, it is different ideas. So there is also need that. And uh, we are also speaking to, to take this opportunity and speed up the, the uh, reintegration process with linking them, uh, children and community with some kinds of services like uh, maybe livelihood. And there is need of some kinds of awareness, uh, awareness raising component we can link with the, the community. And uh, also, uh, we have, uh, this is also one opportunity we can uh, segregate the need of the children according to their age, because they are in the uh, children, the contact with law, there may be different kinds of age there and their needs are different. So this is also one good opportunity uh, if you can prioritize their, their child protection need. Excellent. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Um, any other colleagues who would like to add? And I'll just ask colleagues if there's anything that you feel that you've discussed in your group that hasn't come up so far, if you'd just be able to, to put it, uh, you know, to add that. Anybody who would like to speak, feel free to put up your hands, open your mic. Hello. 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 Please, Hello. Nabil. Okay, this is Nabil uh, from Ethiopia, UNICEF. Please go uh, ahead, Nabil. Okay, uh, some of the things that uh, we discussed in our group is that uh, mentioned by, by my colleague, but uh, I want to capitalize the discussion that we had, mainly on the focusing on the authority capacity building in order to release uh, children with different protection concern, and this is what uh, we currently doing in Ethiopia. Uh, like there was a discussion uh, going on with the justice system at the federal, starting from federal level to the regional level, at least to release children uh, with having depression concern, including uh, considering their age, uh, including pregnant girls, uh, those uh, who are a primary caregiver for their own uh, and other children, and at the same time, uh, who have also uh, suspected with a COVID-19 infection and at the same time uh, who have also, that doesn't do I mean any serious uh, uh, law violation uh, in the systems. Excellent, thanks Nabil for those, uh, those thoughts. And I just have, we just have time for one more comment before we're going to have to wrap up. I've asked our, our producer, Jessica, our fabulous producer to give us two more minutes. But is there anyone else who, who wants to add from their perspective some of the key recommendations, just 30 just seconds? Just to add, sorry, can I, uh, thanks Nabil. I just wanted to add that in our group, we also mentioned that maybe we need to document some of these good practices um, that have come up over the last few months. Because in the last, in the last session, there was a number of really good practices with a lot of examples have come up across different countries um, out of our groups today. So I, I, I'm just putting that out there as a recommendation. Maybe we need to document some of, some of the success stories on this area. Yeah, it's so rare in emergencies, you know. Indeed, that's a great idea, Natalie, and we'll have to take that forward together with her, bring it into the discussions of the small groups yeah. um, <laughs> of the Alliance. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so now I think we'll, we'll have to wrap up now. So I just want to give Natalie, if you could in like, you know, 30 seconds, highlight some of your key key concluding remarks. I know that, you know, it's always difficult because we've had such a rich discussion and I will yeah. try to do the same from my side. Over to you, Natalie. 
Look, I think thanks everyone for your contributions and I think even to the last session as well on Justice for Children and thanks Amanda also for leading um, both sessions. Look, I think it's, it's such an opportunity. Um, as we've both said, we haven't seen this much movement in this sector in emergencies before. Um, and I think we can capitalise on that. It is an opportunity. We have seen a lot of successes and it's about how do we take this now into a non-COVID world? How do we take this success and make it um, apply when COVID isn't such a big issue? How can we make sure kids aren't going into detention? How can we make sure kids have access to social workers and case workers? And how can we make sure that we prevent them from coming in contact with the law? I felt like that was them buzzing me out. Yeah, that was that was well timed. Hey, thank you, thank you, thanks, over. Natalie. Yeah, over, great. Um, so yeah, just from my side, I wanted to highlight maybe if we could just uh, put me on 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 screen, Jessica. I'm not sure if we we still see uh, Natalie on the screen, at least from my side. But just a few. I see you. Okay, great. So a few opportunities for reform that I think are really important that we've really see, for, seen from this. First of all, I mean, the digitization, as we've heard, the digitization has the opportunity to really improve the quality and the accessibility, but also the timeliness of, of justice for children and, and ensure that that is possibility. The, the increased use of alternatives to detention for children in conflict with the law and the increased alignment that we're seeing in terms of um, ensuring that that detention is really a measure of last resort and diversion opportunities are really, really um, highlighted. Of course, I wanted to highlight as UNHCR, we are very keen and we're very happy to see many of, uh, I mean, quite a lot of movement also around the issue of immigration detention. Um, and the fact that we have seen more and more countries really moving to away from immigration detention for children. Obviously, uh, collectively as child protection actors, it's really important that we advocate and continue to support authorities to really um, move towards as fast as possible ending the use of immigration detention in general, but particularly for children. So we've been very pleased as UNHCR to see a number of states um, doing that. and. Um, and really, I think that we really see this as an opportunity to invest more in justice for children, um, to facilitate uh, the reform, sustainable reform of the system, um, and really to provide, uh, really to, to support this effort that we've been working on together to ensure that, that really we are able to limit to the absolute um, minimum uh, the use of detention uh, for children in conflict with the law or for other reasons. Um, and so I'm going to just share, put up on the screen, we're about, oh, we're a few, quite a few minutes over, but I will put up on the screen, just remind all of you and put in the chat box that there are some great resources out there um, that you can refer to and we look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you, everyone.